appreciate Brother Steve leading the singing when we start off on uh, with some songs like that. It's nice to have someone else help that knows what they're doing and help on that. Young folks are getting ready to come and help us with some special music. I switched the uh, I switched the messages around and um, make it a little more. Um, Difficult on my part to uh, bring us into part two after you not hearing part one. But I just felt led even by Wednesday morning. I said, I need to have part two first. And folks who never hear part two so you can hear part two and then back everyone else up to what you might know from number one. So the um, message was entitled more or less continued, but more or less part two. So book of Luke, gospel of Luke, chapter 18. I trust it's of the Lord's burden in leading to come to a message like that and, uh, that we have this morning. And a uh, few folks might catch the burden of this. The tracks are still on the back table, a good number of them, and I think we're down to about 150 letters. If you'd like to take five, six, seven letters or like that, hand out to your neighbors. If, uh, I think I hit my 40th one this week where I thought I'd go a lot faster. Uh, the visits are taking me longer than I thought they would, some of them. Luke 18, just several verses since it's part two, we'll come back to a majority of the reading in the second message, or second service uh, this afternoon. Luke 18, just verse 15, 16, and 17. And they brought unto him also infants, that he should touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, for, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall no wise enter therein it's still kind of a mystery to me with all the studying all the years try and touch on a little this morning suffer or allow little children to come unto me and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of god what a passage more or less heavenly fathers we come to you in prayer bless the service as we continue Thank you for the young folks singing for us this morning. Bless them immensely. Thank you for your goodness through the summer months. Now help us as this new school season begins. Lord, help us be involved in little children and young people coming to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
the songs I sing bring joy to you. Let the words I say confess my love. Let the notes I choose be a favorite tune. And Father, let my heart be after you. Let the songs I sing bring joy to you. Let the words I say confess my love. Let the notes I choose be a favorite too. And Father, let my heart be after you. Father, let my heart be after you. Good job and good words and good singing. I opened today's uh, church mail from yesterday, and it was a letter from Dr. Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, the, the Noah's Ark exhibit. And it said, Ark exhibit gets a zero. And what they got a zero on was a survey was done through the greater Cincinnati, northern Kentucky region of companies that met a social criteria for work, workplace rules, regulations, all like that. Art got a zero. Here's what the rules and regulations, well, who got a hundred? I'll let you know who scored a hundred. Procter & Gamble, centered in Cincinnati, Ohio. Kroger Corporation got a 100. Duke Energy got a 100. Then it's got other companies that got 50s, 70s, 90s. Um, and of course, the National Teachers uh, Educate Organization got a 100. Here was, the, here was the test. Policy includes sexual orientation for all operations. Policies that include gender, identity, and expression for all operations. Equivalency in the same and different sex spousal, medical, and soft benefits. Equivalency in same sex or different sex domestic partner medical and soft benefits. Equal health coverage for transgender individuals. Three, uh, LBGTQ internal training and education best practices. Employee Group or Diversity Council, LBGTQ, Corporate Social Responsibility, Distinct Efforts of Outreach, Employment and Engagement of Broader LGBT Community. Can you see why the Noah's Ark exhibit got an, an, a zero? But on the way home, when Ken Ham got the results of that and it was published, his wife said to him, aren't you scared? He asked, well, what, what do you mean by that? And she said that we're living in a, a society or a culture right now where you have become a public enemy. And then something, I was reading another periodical for those who get the sword of the Lord back here. This was from Dr. M from Dr. Jeff Fugate. Um, part of his article, he had this, the 60s and 70s, were days where America faced the threats of communism, inflation, interest rates at more than 15%, among many other challenges, those who remember the propagation of the ERA amendment, etc. Today we are faced with problems as great as those we, as we faced then. The culture has changed drastically and we are living in a nation of Bible ignorance, and Bible illiteracy, the public education system has turned into an anti-God propaganda machine and even opposes patriotic Americans. Crime is skyrocketing. We have many in positions of leadership who are promoting immorality in every form, natural or unnatural. As a result, children are being confused about the very foundation facts of life. And now the majority live in homes or live in dysfunctional homes. The need is greater now more than ever. And taking that phrase, I come to this passage in the scriptures, more or less. 
more or less. We read in Luke chapter 18, the disciples were trying to forbid people from bringing infants, very young children, to Christ. And Jesus said, allow them to come. The word suffer, I read in Bible commentaries, people know the language much better than me. And why it's used, it has to do with some importunity or with some um, idea that it causes some harm or it would have to do with some inconvenience. The Bible says the Lord is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He puts up with a lot. He suffers a lot in allowing time for sinners to be saved. And it's something that same word is used here. It's going to cost you something. It's going to be some inconvenience. It's going to be some importunity. But allow little children to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of God. Holding a finger there in Luke 18. I'm coming back to it. A secondary passage is Hebrews 10. Verse 25 or 24 says, Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and, and to good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. I would say that from what we say with a casual look, and any spiritual discernment at all, we would say, this generation is not our father's Oldsmobile, that it is different. And we would say, even so, come Lord Jesus. With just a casual look at the scriptures and a casual look at society, we'd say, I believe it might be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Jesus is coming again. If we truly believe that, more or less, if we truly believe that, Jesus is coming again, the world's in a desperate, perilous state, more or less, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We'll come back to that thought in just a moment. I, I'll try. Sometimes when you preach, and you, as the idea of preaching, is that either will be some emphasis that will be burdened upon the pastor to to bring it out more dogmatically and bring it out more bombastically so people say, well, he's really preaching, but that's just his opinion. I don't want it to be my opinion. I want it to be the Bible truth that the Holy Spirit convicts us of. I, I'm in part two, so I'm going to say this. Um, in Sunday school, I'm expressing with the young people, what do you know? What do you know that your parents expect? To him to knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him as sin. James 4, 17. What do you know would make for a good school year? Operate in what you know is right. And to him that doeth it not is a sin. But what do you know about God? What do you know God expects? First John has at least five or six things that it says that we can know about God. And hereby we know that we know him and that we love the brethren. Hereby we know that the spirit abideth in us. We have a conviction for sin, about sin. Hereby we may know that if we believe we have eternal life. A lot of things you can know from the scriptures. Operate in that knowledge. In this Luke chapter 18... Second service, we will discuss the parable of the widow's persistent coming to the unjust judge. It is a parable of contrast. If the unjust judge would eventually avenge, hear her case, and make a ruling for her, then how much more would the loving father, how much more would the loving father hear his children? Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Pray more. That's all I'll say about that for this time. Parable of the Pharisee and the publican, follow that. Isn't that something? The Pharisee praying to himself. 
one in a very pompous thoughts in his own mind, comparing himself to other people and elevating himself. The other very humbly, uh, shamefully before God uh, lets me know he went home justified. Which way should we pray? How should we pray? What way would be the more appropriate way to pray? Then all of a sudden, there's two parables after, uh, you know, following Luke 17, the Lord saying, as it was in the days of Noah, boom, two parables. And one will conclude, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Let's me know it's tied to Luke 17. Pray more. Pray correctly more. And then here comes this. Luke said, uh, the, an, an event. People are trying to bring little children to the Lord. And they're trying to prevent it. And Jesus says, allow them to come. Put up with that. Tolerate that. For such is the kingdom of God. The dedication of the infants of such is the kingdom of God. I would like to think that this has to do with their childlike faith their childlike humility. This would have to do with their, their inquisitiveness. It would just, might be, you know, just from reading and studying and then basic observation of life, little children are curious and, they, and they're perceptive. Um, they, know, they know a grouch from a friendly face. They know someone they can hang with comfortably with one they can't. That's general observation, maybe some studies like this, but um, the focus on this passage is uh, the tendency of a ministries is to make it adult only or adult privileged. Guess pre preachers get together, evangelists get together and say, how was the meeting? Oh, it was a great meeting. And then here, here comes the criteria. Boy, the altars were flooded. Well, what preacher doesn't want folks to respond with commitments? But, boy, the altars were flooded. If the altars weren't flooded, here's the next statement. But I had great liberty to preach. Didn't see much response, but I had great liberty. I could tell the Lord was moving. If it's not that, I'll, I'll give you the criteria of the 80s and 90s. Had 12 saved, and eight of them were adults. Like the four children didn't matter? Or had, had 15 saved? And, and the next question I might ask, and how many of them were children? We had 185 in church. How many of them were bus kids? Oh, you only had 30 adults and the other 150 were kids? <laughs> kids? I'm just sharing that with you. Some would relate to it. Maybe many won't. Praise the Lord if you don't. The, the criteria of ministry. Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19 verse 13. Then were the, there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them, and pray, and the disciples rebuke them. Don't think it's new with our day and age and evangelism and church and pastors like that. This was right in the time of Christ. Jesus. Folks want to hear him. To get to him, they have to make holes in the roof to lower people down because there's such a great crowd about him. On top of all these adults wanting to hear Jesus are these parents trying to get their little kids through the crowd to get them up in the front to Jesus. And I do know that a ministries have to have adults. Ministries have to have money. 
How are you going to run a van route without someone buying the van? How are you going to run the van without someone who can give some money for fuel? How are you going to insure the building if you don't have adults who can pay the insurance? The utilities. It's important to have adults who give. But does that mean that we should cross the line and say, now, this is the adults. That wing over there is for the kids. Oh, Jesus and the priority of his ministry here is has a great multitude of adults around him. But it's those ones trying to get the little children up to Jesus' touch that upset the disciples where Jesus said, you're going to have to tolerate that and put up with that. And then this great weighty statement, for of such is the kingdom of God. Even Charles Spurgeon and all his brilliance, you know, the prince of preachers said that's a mysterious statement. And the, the reasoning, speculation, all about that, for of such is the kingdom of God. Except you be converted and come as little children, you shall know why is inherit the kingdom of God. So obviously the example of faith of children is a priority. Learn from them about that. You speak to them about that, about Christ. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. That's a big deal to kids. You can say to the little children, you know that, hey, Jesus, you know, acknowledge your sin. We're all sinners. B, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. A, B, C. C, confess with thy mouth, thou shalt be saved. And a child will go, sure. And a dog will go, I don't know about that. I need proof. I need more time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I have another periodical. I, Of the time you get to a, a mental awareness of understanding, four to fourteen years old, still still young enough not to be prejudiced by the world, old enough to understand. That's when eighty-five percent of people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. So could I add this? Allow little children to come unto me. This is the prime time for them to be saved. Of such is the kingdom of God, 85% are going to be in heaven said, I got saved in that time frame. To be touched. There is a desire and a real reason folks want to be touched, and I'm going to give you the two top re main reasons. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 35 through 36, there's a great crowd who would bringing many of the sick, the invalid, the halt, and the lame, to be touched by Jesus, knowing that if he touched them, he'd heal them. Now, who wouldn't want to get somebody to someone by their very touch could heal them of terrible disease? But there's another passage in Mark 5, verse 37 through 21, where there's a woman who'd been ill for many years, and she said, if I, may but, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, he may heal me. So I'm sure there were some parents and there was, that was, I'm getting my child to Jesus because of, there's some ailment. There's some invalidity. I want Jesus to heal them. 
And buddy, a parent will fight through a line to get their child to Jesus if it meant a healing. But the predominant way that the word touched is used in the scriptures is that of a laying on of a hand to signify, uh, signal out a special ordination. I don't know how many passages I can go through with this on this. Acts 6, verse 16, the first deacons as they were ordained with the laying on the hands. Acts chapter 18, verse, or at chapter 8, verse 17, the new converts of Samaria, and when they laid hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 9, verse 17, Ananias, and reluctantly at that, came into the house on the straight street, the straight boulevard, and found a chief enemy of the gospel of Christ, at least in his mind up to now. And the Lord told Ananias, I have need of him. He's special to me. It's Saul. Go lay your hands on him. I have need of him. Much good from him do. And Ananias touched Saul. When we come in 1 Timothy Chapter 5, verse 22, Paul will tell Timothy to stir up the gift which is within you at the laying on of my hands. I'm telling you, someone will just want to bring their child to Jesus because they know with his touch, there's an ordination. With his touch, there's a signification of, of a special calling and duty. They want their child to be touched by Jesus. Healing or a blessing on their life. So, if I can come back to this, to the point number one, folks, we must desire for boy, for boys and girls to come to Jesus. Must want it. Must be a priority. For if such is the kingdom of God in their age, in their perception, in their willingness, in their faith, we have to desire boys and girls to come to Jesus. And with that desire, number two, desire knowing something is one thing in it. Doing it is another. There must be an effort to bring them to Jesus. You get an idea of the title more or less? With the age of young people being saved, and the age of the, their receptiveness, their perception, their age of their willingness, etc. With that... My, my goodness, more effort to bring them to Christ. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, verse 5. Now, I tell you what, that's jumping in for time. We have time. Verse 3. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Do you want one more rewards in heaven? Do you want more recognition in heaven? Do you want to be at least where God says, Now that is a child in whom I am well pleased? Gonna to have to come like that little child. That Jesus had come and set him in the midst. I I can just see all the pompous adults sitting around there. Maybe, maybe the many the, maybe there's many unlearned and they're just set in their ways, or maybe there's the learned ones all sitting around there. And you know, and what's Jesus going to teach us today? And he calls a little child and says, you are going to have to come like that. And then we come to verse 5. And whoso, whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Do you? You have an open house for the Lord? Is your house receptive to the Lord? The Lord's welcome? So I say the house of this house. Is, the Lord, is there an open house sign for the Lord in your life? 
then receive that little child whom Jesus is receiving. Treat and act towards that little child. Verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The word hinder or offend is the word hinder. There's other places in the scriptures that's actually translated that way, such as he that now letteth or hindereth. But here we have, whoso shall offend one of these little ones. Do you want to turn a little one away from Jesus? Do you want to behave in such a way it would turn a little one away from Christ? Let me tell you what, how you would be better off. Travel about five and a half hours or five hours north of here and just go past Cedarville University. On that country road, just past Cedarville University, there's a sign that points to the left and it'll say Clifton Gorge or Clifton Gorge Mill. It's a historic site. It was there in the time of the, even in the uh, French and Indian War and in Revolutionary Times and Pioneers to Ohio. It is, I think, I think the sign says there, one of the last, last two operating mills in the United States. This pioneer family established, and on that stream, they built a mill with the big paddle thing like you. When I say operating, there's others that operate, but this one still grinds. You can still bring in the wheat or the oats. This one still grinds it, and you can purchase it. And you can watch it in operation. Christmas time is spectacular. They decorate it with four million lights. And in that little country community in Ohio, it's worth driving up there just to see the whole thing lit up in Christmas lights. But what's fascinating is when you go in there to watch and, and the mill is placed on the big stone and the grinding stone is loaded with wooden cogs and gears, and it comes down and begins to grind it, you get a good idea what a several hundred pound millstone's like. And I couldn't help but stand there and think, and watching that, that the Lord said it would be better off if that massive stone was bound to your neck and you were thrown into the sea than to keep one child from coming to Christ. There's not a good thing about a millstone about the neck in deep water. The rest of this passage still, you, you think it's transferring, but it's not. The subjects, woe unto the world because of offenses. Do you think, follow the message, do you think there's a lot against children today coming from, to Christ? Do you think the commercialization of, and, and the sexuality of clothing, textbooks, music industry, movie industry, Satan's attack on the family and the, the uh, disintegration of a nuclear family? Do you think Satan is not after? Do you think, think this through? Be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You've all seen the nature specials on TV. You know, and they're watching for the weak, the pride of the lions. And you think like they're sleeping half the day. Do you know who the lions, you know who the lions primarily attack? The sick. The one who has the lame leg and can't run. That's easy prey. You know who else they attack? The strays. There's an excellent picture someone, someone in the church put on Facebook. Excellent picture. There's a group of zebras over here, and there's one zebra over here running for its life <laughs> with a lion chasing it. It said, yeah, and the statement, whoever put it out there was pretty good, and this is the one that didn't think it needed the assembly. Why? go after the strays 
There's no circle of the musk ox around there. Or there's no the, the big bull elephant or the, or the big uh, wildebeest, you know, with the horns coming from every direction. That's easy prey for the lion, the invalid, the sick, or the stray. But do you know what is the primary target for the lions? The small ones. Can't run very fast. Don't know any don't know any elusive moves. The small. Who do you think Satan, if Satan knows that between four and fourteen years old is not even not even close, it is the majority of when someone will be saved and come to Christ. Who do you think he will send his primary assault after? Some after the strays, some after the sick. They don't have the protection of the assembly. But primarily, he's going after the youth. Woe unto the world unto the world because of offenses. Woe to the teacher who's teaching young people sex don't matter. Transect woe to the teacher who's teaching kids they came from monkey. Woe to the doctor who opens his clinic tomorrow morning to tear apart a child. For it must needs be that offenses come. That's part of life. This world. The devil's a prince and power of the air. But woe to, to that man by whom the offense cometh. Wherefore, if thine hand or foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast in everlasting fire. Now let's talk about just directing it inter internally and towards ourselves. If you know that you're offending yourself from keeping to Jesus, maybe by what you see. Pornography. Maybe what you see, the lust and coveting of the things of the world. Watch what he said. If you knew that of yourself, that you yourself you were offending or hindering, keeping yourself come to Christ by your eyes, watch what he said. It would be better to pluck your eye out than go to hell. He'll come down if you see his it has two hands or two feet. If you know that by your feet and where you walk with the wrong crowd, in the wrong places, doing the wrong thing, he said, you'd be better off to amputate that foot than to go to hell. You think it switched subjects? It hasn't. Look down verse 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Here's what I believe. I believe it's good, sound, fundamental, old-time belief. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14 about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits to them that are the heirs of salvation? What? What are angels? They're ministering spirits to bring these, to bring the heirs of salvation, the ones who will accept Christ, the ones who will become joint heirs with Christ, be part of Christ's families. They are ministering spirits to direct that path to Jesus. Children have that appointed ministering spirit reporting to the throne of God about his children. And can you see an angel, angel and the sons of God presented themselves, Job chapter 1, some to attack or accuse God's children. But can you see an angel reporting before the throne of God and said, reporting loud and clear, sir, that so-and-so, this little six-year-old girl, that little eight-year-old boy, Lord, I'm here to report that this man and that woman is standing in their way from coming to you. Do you know what he said? 
woe to someone doing that. The report reaches heaven. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. There's an angel in heaven reporting your name. We're all so quiet and somber. I think we're getting the seriousness of the burden of this message, aren't we? This is big. This is serious business with the Lord. This is the primary, this is the primary body of Christ being saved for 4 to 14 years old. I'm thinking he's taking it very serious, don't you? For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. He's not finished. Just go ahead and if you want to. Verse 14. Even so, it is not when he says come to seek and to save that which is lost. Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven. That one of these little ones should perish. Brother Rick, I'd sure like to know the will of God, where this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, that you give thanks. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Grateful people. Hey, can I stop right there and give a, give a, give a Wednesday night pro promo right here? Take a break from the message. Wednesday night as we're connecting the Testaments, we're now moving in to... Um, the wilderness. I know this whole series of Sunday school lessons called the wilderness wandering. But you want to connect the Old Testament, New Testament. That is one of the primary connections of the Old Testament is the wilderness. 1 Corinthians 10 itself is going to say, now these were written for our examples. The wilderness. And I'm just promoting Wednesday night to say this. You want to know you can go through life and it can be a journey of joy or it can be wilderness wandering. You want to know how to make you want to know how to make it joyful, or do you want to make a progression of one step after another to the grave? Connect. The reason I'm saying that is, what is the will of God? You be grateful. A grateful people. I'm just going to go ahead and jump ahead and say it. What is one of the primary things you know about the wilderness wanderings? They grumbled the whole way through. Murmuring and grumbling. Every event and everything they came to, they griped about. How do you want to go through life? Wednesday night. Every place they came, will you find it a place of joy and expectation of God's working? Or will you find another place to complain? Maybe that what I'm saying, promote Wednesday night's not working. Maybe you're going to say, I ain't going for that. Depends how you want to go through this life, how this journey, how you approach every event. I know this. What's God's will? That's what led me to it. You be grateful. What's God's will? Isn't it something he said this about his will? Knowing what the will of the Lord is, that you be filled with the Spirit, not drunk with wine or success. It's God's will that you be Spirit-filled. It's got to be, will you should be grateful. God is not long-suffering that any should perish, but is long-suffering to us that all should come to repentance. Not willing that any man should perish, but come to the knowledge of the, of, of the truth. You know what God's will is? That you be saved. And come to a knowledge of the truth. You want to know what God's will is? Brother Rick, I want to go from this service this morning having nailed down one thing that's God's will. Even so, it is not the will of, the, of your Father, which is in heaven, that one of these little ones should perish. He has just given the sternest warning in the scriptures about hindering a little one from coming to Christ because that of such is the kingdom of God. Here's what God's will is, that no child be kept from Jesus. Let us desire to see boys and girls come to Christ. Let us be earnest that we get them there. Found this article. Well, 
Matthew 25. If you've done it unto them, you've done it unto me. I want you to see the depth, how the scriptures tied together before I put this conclusion on here. Matthew 25, verse 34. Some entitled this passage, since it's after chapter 24, the tribulation period, the return of Christ, the judgment of the nations. There's going to be a judgment which God deals with how people went through those seven years of tribulation. Just like World War II and the Holocaust, there were many, many people who provided a room or a meal for a hiding Jew or a suffering child. Verse number 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was, let's say, hungry, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, foreigner, wonder, and ye took me in. You gave me a place to stay. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungry, or fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? And when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king, catch this now, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. You did it to me. When you found my children destitute, needing a place to stay for the night, and you took them in and you gave them a room, you did that to me. When you found they didn't have anything to eat, maybe they're running from the Antichrist, but even in this day and age you can say this, you found that they didn't have anything to eat and you bought an extra Kroger card, you bought an extra Walmart card, you took them and said, here's an extra, buy yourself a drink. When you did it to them, you did it for me. You found out, it's hard to say this now, you found out they didn't have anything to wear. Or what they had to wear was worn out, and that's kind of hard to tell today. I was at the ball game the other night, and I thought just a couple years ago when this torn up britches thing came in about, that was about as foolish as you can get, but it was just the knee, or maybe it was just one patch of the pocket. My folks now right there, it's basically held together now here, and the whole thing's a hole. And there's a patch of clothes on the back right here. And I know my, t my girls are tired of me saying, boy, I, I didn't know you so up against it. When we at church, we'll try to take up an offering so you can get some britches. But there are some out there that don't have clothes. There's, so there's still some out there in need. And uh, you say, all I did was... All I did was get them two shirts so they can go to school and an extra pair of socks. And, you know, and all I got them was a T-shirt and a pair of shorts. And the Lord said, yeah, but you did that for me. You get it? There was someone sick in their family, and I took them a bowl of, ch I took them a bowl of chicken soup. And the Lord says, thank you for the soup. And then he goes on to say, and when he saw them this way and you did nothing for them, he also goes on to say, and you did that against me too. So I come back to say, you're seeing how these scriptures all tie together. And to those who need the Lord most and those who'd want the Lord most, 4 to 14 years old. Maybe 15, 16, but that's what the survey said of the BIMI Missionary Corps of all their converts. Desire to see that primary group come to get to Jesus and get touched by Jesus and then be involved to get them there. Make an effort to get them there. And here comes this story. I've heard this before. I just didn't see all the details before. And this was an article written by historian James Ray, an encounter with Robert Rakes. He was on a tour group going throughout Europe, and they're showing some of the primary sites of, uh, of England and they were in London, and they were seeing the big sites and the number of sites, and they passed a statue going through a back, back road of London. They passed a statue of a man standing with his hands out and, and holding, a, holding a 
textbook, and uh, Brother Ray said, and who's that? And almost like a side note, the uh, tour guide said, that's Robert Rakes, founder of Sunday schools. In the 18th century, a world unknown to millions in England, historian C.B. Evie wrote, the physical, intellectual, and moral conditions of the masses were deplorable. People lived in dwellings rudely put together. Often geese, chickens, and pigs occupied the same premises. The people wore coarse clothing, existed on poor diets, slept on straw. And in industrial cities like Gloucester, conditions were especially bad. There was no system of public education. Few common people had the privilege of attending even an elementary school. It was not easy to find a poor man who could read. Ignorance and vice and dissipation and ungodliness prevailed, especially among the lower classes. As a result, prisons were filled with people of all types, from confirmed criminals to respectable persons who were in prison because they could not pay their debts. During those years, the children of England were little more than white slaves. They worked long, weary hours in the mills and factories. They were in uh, little more than sweatshops. Their day began at day daylight and ended after dark. It wasn't until 1847 that Parliament passed a child labor law that stated children could no longer work more than 10 hours a day picture of one of the mills and the, and the boys lined up. I mean, these are, these are eight, nine, 10, 12 year old boys in one pair of jeans, some of them barefooted, one shirt, just kids working the shops and the mills and the mines. The Industrial Revolution was in the process of dismantling the village crafts in favor of the smoky, dingy, mass-producing factories. Thousands were leaving the villages and flooding into the cities. Very often, there was no place for these immigrants from the countryside. Robert Rakes enters the scene. His father ran a... News, was a newspaper publisher in Gloucester. And when he passed away, Robert inherited the, bit of the business and became the editor. He began to champion the cause of the poor and the underprivileged. He would visit them in their workshops and in the prisons. He began to publish articles and became, uh, became the notice of others throughout the region. He was 31 years old when he married Ann Thrigg. They lived in a nearby village, Newham. They had 10 children. Eight survived to adulthood. He continued to champion the cause of the poor, but he saw that he needed to do more than just publish papers. It burdened his heart. The children of Gloucester, uh, he saw them on Sundays. They're one day off running the streets wild uh, in moral filth. He knew he had to try and do something to change this, to make a difference. 1779, Parliament had even passed a law, the Enabling Act, which legalized other schools than those operated by the state religion. Acting immediately, Rake started his first Sunday school in 1780. The location was the kitchen of Miss Meredith. Rakes intended to teach these children to read and write and use the Bible as a textbook. The first Sunday school would not only be Sunday school about the Bible, but religious edu uh, education in other things, math and reading. The school was open for children from 6 to 14 years of age. The lessons would be on words of spelling like obedient, covetous, transgression. A copy of the page in the children's social study book was this. Question, did the world make itself? Answer key, no. If the clock had a maker, much more the world had a maker. Question two, how do you prove that there's a God? Answers, answer key, by common sense. Two, by conscience. Three, by tradition. Four, by the Sabbath. Five, by the scriptures. Statement under conscience. 
filled in by the children. Conscience proves that there is a God as a constable who serves with a warrant that there proves there's a magistrate. This is heavy stuff. Question three, how do you prove the truth of the gospel or that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Answer key, by the miracles that he wrought and the prophecies that are fulfilled, then they'd list the prophecies. The change in the children of the city was astounding. By 1786, six years after his Sunday schools began, by unanimous vote, the city gave Rakes an honorary, degree, an honorary award for his accomplishment. By 1792, 12 years after the start, there was not one criminal defendant in Gloucester. Here's, here's a continuation just in facts. By 1784, there were 2,000 children attending Sunday school. Uh, in the, in the country, uh, city of Leeds alone, 250,000 children were attending as other Sunday schools began throughout England. A parliamentary return in 1818 gave a total of 477,225 kids were in Sunday school uh, by 1818. In 1833, the number had increased to over 1 million. By 1851, 2 million children, 6 to 16, were in Sunday school. The United States, the movement, was propelled across the pond. A leading minister in 1848 declared to, in a letter record in Princeton University, America has practically been saved for Christianity and religion, the religion of the Bible, by the Sunday school. In April 5th, 1811, Robert Rakes passed away. Children lined the route through the alleys of Gloucester to sing in his passing. They were rewarded a plum and a shilling. It says on his tombstone, Robert Rakes Esquire, late of this city, founder of Sunday schools, departed this life April 5th, 1811. In 40 years, he saved, as is recognized, England, and saved, as is recognized by theologians and universities, America, by getting children to Jesus. And you think God doesn't bless that? I say to the church again, more or less, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, More desire to see boys and girls come to Christ and more effort to do it. And I can see the Lord saying, look what they're doing for me, unto me. Amen. We'll come back to part one in the second service. Thank you for being here for part two. Let's close with a word of prayer. heads are bowed and eyes are closed if you see Satan's assault on the young people this generation do you think they need Sunday school or not do you think they need Wednesday night prayer and Bible study hour for young people do you think they need a church service with a Bible preaching more or less Holy Father, I pray our hearts be burdened. Thank you for the testimony of those who got in the harvest field and found the little ones and brought them to Jesus. Help us be uh, alert and attentive and earnest and desirous in the effort. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing a verse.